Good evening, everybody. Welcome on Zoom on this Tuesday night. You in for a wonderful evening for the word of the Lord, the revelation of the Lord to be able to position you to move forward. And the word that the Lord has given us is that you have to advance. The Lord is telling you to advance. Don't stop. Doesn't matter what's going on around you. Doesn't matter what anxiety or fearful or dreadful situations um, is going on around you. Don't focus on the natural. God says, look with your spiritual eyes. We have to look at our spiritual eyes. And um, the Lord said to us, the violent take it by force. The kingdom of God suffers violence. The violent take it by force. And God wants us to be spiritually violent, to say, not on my watch, you know. I'm just, you know, I, even if I'm holding on with my pinky nail, you know, I am holding on. And I'm pushing forward. And I'm grabbing that last strength together. And I'm, I'm moving forward to advance violently, spiritual violence. We don't, we don't want to be passive. All right. So is that exciting? Yeah. Okay. Say hi to everybody. Hi. There's thousands of people here. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> they sound like thousands of people, but there's, th there's thousands of angels here. Uh, before we start the worship, I just want to share something quickly that's not fitting in with my sermon. So let me share it before the time. Okay, so uh, the Lord spoke to us a while ago and gave us uh, Isaiah 49. Um, and for us personally, and I knew it was something, it was just a rhema chapter with a lot of stuff in it. And the Lord said, at an appointed and at a uh, favorable time, I will answer you. Which shows me that you've prayed much and you've interceded much. And the Lord has heard everything about those prayers and your fasting and everything. But there is an appointed or a favorable time, which seemed to me it, it's in a certain season where God answers that prayer and make it come to pass. And we are in that season of restoration. We are in the season of restoration. We are in the season of rest and expansion. Okay, we're talking about it. Many of us come from a confined place spiritually. We've come through a long season where we feel we're in such a small spiritual space. You can't even, or either, even in the natural. I don't know if anybody was in jail in this last season. But, um, but Joseph was in a confined space for two years and nothing he could do could make him get out of that place sooner. He had to wait for God's appointed time, for God to stir something up somewhere so that his gifts was needed and somebody remembered him. So I prophesy over you that people will remember you, people will see you, people will see your work, and people will call for you, and God will create a situation where you are needed as a solution to the problem. That's just how it works. But Joseph had favor, he had gifts, he had talents, but nothing he could do could get him out of that that season of confinement sooner. He had to wait. And can you imagine how frustrated it is? And the Bible said, the guys that said, I'll remember you, forgot him. Until the time where God created the situation where, where they remembered. So the season that we are moving, we're moving into a place of rest. Because when you build, when you're in a harvest season, you can't always, um, you can't always war. You have to expand. And there has to be a level of rest where there is warfare. But God comes in and God um, releases a grace upon you. Um, because he's already promised you that inheritance. So there's a grace and there's a flowing with the angels and the, and the angels go with you to expel and evict the enemies that's in your places of promised land and your new inheritance. So it's not like the previous season where you had this dirty warfare and there was blood all over the place and, you know, it was like a clean of sorts. There will be warfare, but there's a grace that's going to move with that. There's going to be an ease because of the season that I've changed, but also of the stuff that God has taught you. You are not the same than you were two, two years ago. Who knows what I'm talking about? Okay, you're armed and dangerous and you know what to do. So we are in, in that season where God wants to bring us into a spiritual place of rest and expansion, which is a broader place where you can breathe and you can build and expand. So I've just got the scripture and then, we can, then we're going to pray. If Kari was here, she's going to, they would have smacked him. What's Kari so long probably? Okay, but now it's like I'm going to talk nice and long. No, I'm just joking. All right. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. so I'm joking. That Joshua 21, uh, verse 43 to 45. Let me read it to you, and then we're going to pray it, and we're going to sing. Is that okay? Yeah. We don't have to do it every time the same way. Okay, so Joshua 21. This is now when they moved into the promised land. They come to a certain season of maturity. They come to a certain season where, whew, you know, this was so amazing. And it was a season where there was a settling anointing upon them. And listen to the scripture quickly. Look at me, Kristen. We're looking at me. Okay, good. Thank you, Lord, that I bind every spirit of distraction Amen. in Jesus' name. Let's focus. 
Joshua 21 verse 43. Listen to this. So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and lived in it. So there came a time when the Lord says, I have given you all the inheritance, all the territory. There's nothing missing. All, all. There comes a time when the Lord says, I've given you all that I've even sworn to your forefathers. God has made promises to some of your forefathers that, that no, it doesn't matter if they were on fire or not, or just religious, you know. God hears all our prayers. And God has given uh, prophetic words, and God has given promises to your ancestors, and, and all those things. God is coming in this season, and even promises that He gave to the previous generation is going to do it through you. And you're going to receive an inheritance of stuff that your forefather, forefathers just prayed for, but they prayed it into being. You don't know what they prayed. Many times we see, we call it the synergy of the ages, where God is just putting together all the prayers of the previous generations, because they are dead, but their prayers aren't dead. So God is working with all those prayers. and God is a tri-generational God. He puts all the prayers together. And, 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 and it, it, it works on your behalf to, to release a harvest in this season. For it's a global kingdom harvest season. Your forefathers didn't live in the kingdom age. You are born for such a time as this. So there's a, there's a dimension that they pray for that you're going to experience in this season. You're going to taste it. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so God's even going to give you an inheritance of seed you haven't even sown. You think, Lord, I didn't even sow this. I don't know where it comes from. This is so amazing. So in your timing, the seasons, the previous generation promises are coming to pass. And then the Bible says the Lord gave them rest from conflict on all sides. Amen. We want some rest from conflict on all sides. I think pretty much there's a lot of conflict from all the sides at the moment. And God says, part of this settling anointing, when you shift into a new season, it's not only that I'm, I'm giving you all that I've promised, but it's also I'm giving you rest from the battles from all sides in accordance to everything that I've sworn to your forefathers. And God remembers the promises He has made to your family, to your generations. He's a covenant-keeping God. We saw with, with David, when David was dead and the, and the next generations messed up so terribly with, with, um, with idolatry and far away from God, God... The Bible says God needed to release judgment upon them, but then he remembered his covenant to David and he gave them more mercy. And God wants to cash in and God wants to do everything he can on, uh, on the covenants that he has made with you. And um, he wants to help, give us that favor that, that even he had with our forefathers upon our lives. He wants to release that favor upon us and he remembers that. And then the last scripture, verse 45 says, The Lord handed over all the enemies to them. All your enemies will be handed over to you. All the stuff that is attacking you, all the physical en enemies, the spiritual enemies, there will be a, a handing over to you. You will vi be victorious over them in Jesus' name. And then the Bible says, Not one of the good promises which the Lord has spoken to the house of Israel failed, and all had come to pass. And this is a, this is a scripture of, of, that I've, I've read that talks about restoration, rest and expansion. A coming together and a releasing of the promises of God. And also just to rest in Him and those enemies of the previous season that the Lord are dealing with them. And the Lord is releasing that promises that He made to you. Everything, not one falling to the wayside, not one um, failing. And uh, because God is a covenant keeping God. And there's something about His covenant power that, that secures His faithfulness. The Bible says, although you have, have been faithless or didn't have any faith, He remains faithful to His covenant. So there's something that God does to, to bring His covenants to pass that is not connected to your faith or your faith, faithfulness. Because that's why God does it. Because He can't lie. He can't lie. So, so it's something... That God releases in His word that He wants you to have. He wants you to have breakthrough. And even if He stands on His own faithfulness, it will come to pass. So you just need, you really need, don't need a lot to be able to, to access the promises and the covenants of God. Okay, so I'm very excited. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight in the name of Jesus. Let's just stand as we pray.
Father, I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you are, Father, releasing an anointing tonight upon us, Father, to, to advance. Father, you are saying to us, don't stop. Don't let circumstances make you stop. Don't look at the vortexes and, and the stuff around you that the enemy is, uh, the, the dust storms and the stuff that is, that is blowing up around you to make you feel intimidated, to make you feel fearful and anxious. And anxi there's just a smoke screen. So, Father, I thank you that you help us to draw our eyes back to you, Lord Jesus. That we'll focus on you and not on, on, on the havoc and the stuff that the enemy so cleverly can create around us to slow us down. Father, I prophesy in the name of Jesus that you break your people free Lord from every rope and chain and of the enemy Lord over our hearts and our minds over our emotions I bind the spirit of fear I bind dread I bind anxiety I bind the terrible emotions Lord that 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 comes from the enemy's voice that tells us it's the it's the end we're not gonna make it you're not gonna make it father we block and stop and we silence that voice and we know it's just a distraction it's just a distraction so father we shift our eyes to you I thank you father that you are I release a momentum in this place tonight to advance. Father, the kingdom of God suffers violence and it's the violent that take it by force. So, Father, I thank you that we will be violent in the midst of the violence. Father, I release a, a violent anointing upon God's people that will cause shift their faith, cause shift their confidence to move forward in the name of Jesus to say, well, I'm not going to be blocked in this contention. I'm not going to be blocked in this area. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to slow down. I'm not going to allow the enemy to slow me down. I'm not going to be distracted. We break that, Father, and I prophesy into the spiritual realm. Father, an anointing to advance, a violent anointing to rise up and say, I am not throwing away my inheritance. Father, we break the invitations of the enemy to, to make us partner with death, to make us give up on our harvest. We break that line and we declare we shall not, we shall not, we shall not. So Father, tonight release a corporate anointing for us to advance, to shift and change our hearts and our minds. And Father, to move us forward into the direction, Father, where you want us to be, uh, to be in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Jesus, we are hungry for you tonight. We are hungry, we are desperate for you, Jesus, in our midst. There's no other name through which we can be saved. There's no other name that is higher. Oh, you are the rose of Sharon. You are the bright morning star. You are our king of glory. You are our king of glory. You are our all in all, Jesus. Father, we take this time and we call upon you, Jesus. Come into our midst, Yeshua. We need you. We need you. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. Come and touch me tonight. Come and touch my marriage. Come and touch my finances. Come and touch my family. Come and touch my health. Come and touch me, Jesus. Only you. One touch from the Master. One touch from the Master. One touch. Everything is broken. Everything is all. Shabababababarobosoto. One touch. Just say, Jesus, touch me tonight. I ask you, Jesus, touch me. Touch my life. I humble myself before you tonight. And humble submission. And I say, Jesus, nothing will help. Nothing will work. Not my gifts. Not my talents. Nothing. Not my finances. Only you. It's only you that will satisfy. You are the only solution to my problem. So, Father, tonight, I ask you for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to surround me like a whirlwind like a whirlwind surround me Holy Spirit and I ask that you recalibrate me shift me tonight break me loose from any intimidation any fear any dread I break it I break it I break it I declare a shift tonight Anything that wants to stop me and hinder me, I break your power. I prophesy. I declare. I decree. I shall advance. I am violent. Make me violent. Holy Spirit, release fresh hope, fresh power in my inner man. In the name of Jesus, I declare and I decree. I am moving forward. In the mighty name of Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord, tonight. I invoke your power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to break down walls of impossibility, wall of resistance, walls that have blocked me. I command it to break, to break, to break by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Whew, how was that? Sure. Are you ready to swing from the chandeliers? If we had some. It's a good idea for the future. Okay, wasn't that good? Are you feeling stirred? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence in this place. And uh, let's, let's hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Thank you, Lord. Just let's stay tuned and let's keep our faith activated. Remember, it's unity received from God. Be like a little sponge. Let that hunger of the Holy Spirit come from be expectant because your expectancy um, releases the hunger um, that will attract the Holy Spirit. Okay, we shouldn't be complacent and whatever and just passive, but should be living stones that said, Lord, I want what you have for me tonight. Okay, so thank you, Kristen. Um, in worship, I just saw God take this huge paintbrush, like huge, and it was just with all the rainbow colors, it's just painting us full of it. And I just felt, just God said that He's really in the season bestowing us all our spiritual gifts. Like I felt like, like He's, he's, he's saying He's making us almost like multi-tooled, multi-gifted, multi-stuff. Because in this, in this environment, on this season, like it almost feels like you have to be so much of everything to be able to cope and to do stuff these days. You know, like you can't just be one thing. You know, you have to be almost like multi-purposed. And I felt like God said, even in the kingdom, He's making us multi-purposed, multi-giftings, um, multi um just like in every like area, like if it's prophetic, if it's in healing, God say in this season He's really gonna make us prepared for anything and for any situation. Amen. Amen. This one comes up. This is so important because God has trained you in multiple areas in this last season. Right? You said, Lord, how many deaths do I need to die? How many things do I need to go through? But the Lord has prepared you in multiple seasons, so you have to have multiple skills and a variety of skills to be able to defend yourself in war in this season. So, so I don't think that God was, was nasty to you or He didn't care. It was, it's training for reigning. And, and that's why He trained us in a variety of places. Please come to the front. I saw the Holy Spirit show me a, a kettle on a, on a gas stove. And I saw how Jesus was turning it up and up until the steam came out and the, the whistle sound um, went off. And um, I experienced that God is saying that He let us go through trials and tribulations and all that difficult time so that we can release a new sound in the spiritual realm and um, something new. And um, I also felt that, that the Lord reminded me of Hannah and that, she, that He allowed Penina, whatever her name is, to, to um, in, annoy her and to bring her to a place of, of uh, releasing a sound of desperation. And I feel that heaven wants us to release that desperation sound. And also I saw a spring and um, God says that there's purpose in the, in, the, in the stretching. And as we get stretched more and more, we will be able to, to resist the enemy more. And he cannot resist us that more, y'all. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Mm. Amen bounce back so it's that momentum remember your problems um, is the platform to be catapulted into the new season it creates that momentum that springboard okay so it's strange but that's how the kingdom works please come my word actually ties in a lot with Wagner's. Um, the scripture that I read this week and in something relating to it is in Luke 9 verse 23 and the message translation reads um, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. Don't run from suffering, but embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. And then what I wanted to read in relation to that was such a profound revelation to me, but I felt strongly to share it. It says that many seem to think that the relationship we have with Christ makes us co-leaders with him. But notice Christ's words in this passage. It says he doesn't mention anything about us going with him, but instead, instead about following after him. Jesus is the leader and he doesn't share that role with anyone else. He's the one that will determine the way that we should go and not ourselves. It means that even when we don't like, understand or agree with what he is doing and his leadership, we are committed to still follow him no matter what. And I believe that God wants us to have a greater revelation and understanding of his love, even in the midst of trials, that we know that his love isn't 
less because of going through trials, but as Wagner said, it's actually God wants to use every little detail to bring good into our lives, and it's for our growth and for our character building and maturing, as Anton said earlier as well. Good word. Remember the Bible says, as you share in Christ's suffering, so you will share in His glory. And many things you have gone through, Christ also went through it. And the purpose why you go through it is so that, so that you can share in His glory. Okay, and if you successfully go through it, then you overcome that, you share in the glory of Christ in that area. Okay, so this is amazing. Thank you. Um, I just had this um, picture actually during the week in my quiet time, but I felt to share it corporately. Um, I was, there was this net basically in the heavens and it was full of harvest. And I was just like trying to get one little thing out that hole over there, like just, just that one little, just, you know, we all have that one little thing, like, um, and then next thing, this net literally just like ripped open and this entire harvest just came down. And we all know in Malachi 3 verse 10, it says, um, bring the whole of the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord. Will I not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive it? And all of us have seed in the ground and we might be feeling like, okay, it's now. Like, or can I just, can I just get that one little like harvest? But God's saying there's a set time and at the set time, he will open the windows of heaven and we will not have room enough to receive that harvest. Seems like I'm on a double shift tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, that you are doing miracles at the hospital. Can we pray? Can, can we pray for the, the lady at the hospital? Is that okay? You know, work with me. Okay. How many fingers do I do I see? Okay, good. Some people are looking like my like whatever. Okay, let's just pray for that. The, the prayer of agreement. Listen, I tell. Let me give you that t the testimony before we pray. Um, one night we prayed for, for that child that was in hospital that had the pills. Uh, you know your, um, your daughter's, your son-in-law's boss, that child. And, and as we were praying just corporately, they recorded the prayer and they, they WhatsApped it to the mom and dad and they repetitively played that prayer that we corporately prayed over the child and there was a supernatural turnaround. I tell you, when God doesn't need distance. So let's just stand together and, and we just pray. Father, let's just pray with me. Father... We just stand together as the body of believers. And Father, we want to intercede for this lady. We're carrying them on and the hospital. And Lord, I thank you that we hook our shields with them. And we pray tonight that as they pray, that you'll give them divine revelation that will be so sharp that as they wield their swords, and they come against this power of darkness. They come against death. They want to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Father, that you uproot that spirit tonight from that lady's body. In the name of Jesus, we pray for release of the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon Kari and Marisa. To execute, to execute the power, the power of, heaven, of heaven, the power of the Holy Spirit, the of the Holy Spirit to, set free, to set your daughter free, to reverse, to reverse and to break, and to break this, assignment this assignment upon her life. Upon her life. And we declare and decree, and we, and we trust you we trust for a supernatural, supernatural turnaround, turnaround in, her in her situation, in her health. In her health. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. That you, will get the glory. that you will get the glory in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for praying. Okay, so, yeah, so let's hear what's happened. We trust the Lord for this is the season of the miraculous. We will see really supernatural things happening. We need to get ourselves ready for that. And even that God's going to use us, old and young and what's the in between age? Uh, medium or uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, middle, middle slach. Okay, whatever. All right, so God's going to use all of you in your sphere of influence. And, uh, you know, we're going to step out in this season. And um, 
remember I told you that as we move from Passover to Pentecost, we've got this month in between where the Lord was really, the whole focus was on covenant. The whole focus where God is saying, in this month, um, things might be tough. And I have a, have an, a biblical, for, according to biblical patterns, it was a tough time before Pentecost. And um, because of that, the Lord says, this, uh, this situations that are tough around you is an invitation for you to hold on to my covenant nature and pursue me and pursue me who I am to you. Um, and I'm in, inviting you in every part of who I am to experience you as a covenant keeping God. As a, a, a God wants to give you a personal experience. There's nothing that can counterfeit that if you have your own experience. This is what God wants to do. And God is, is don't, don't run away from me. Don't, don't move. Just come to me and run to me and trust and release your faith for that part of my covenant where I want to show, I want to provide for you. And, um, and so I, sus I suspect that it would be a very turbulent time up to Pentecost. And that's why God wanted us to, to create a platform and um, almost like a, a, a sort of a platform in, in the natural where He can do those things for us as you trust in His covenant nature and you, and you hold on to Him. But I really feel that that is one side of the coin. You know, pushing into that covenant, covenant nature of God and pressing in by faith and saying, Lord, you are my provider. Lord, you are the banner of victory over me. I will not fail. I will not fail. You are, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are Jehovah Rapha. You all those names uh, that, that is part of God, El Shaddai. All those names, God wants to show himself mighty in every area. And it's so good. We talked about training in various areas. If you know God in every area and you have a testimony in every area of, you know, that, that, that God represents covenant wise, then you have then you have a testimony. You have a background with God to say we have, um, have personal experience with one another. But I really, I really feel the other side of the coin is, and part of the pro process is, the one side is pursuing covenant, the others, other side of the coin is to repair the breaches in covenant. To repair the breaches in covenant. Now what happens is many of us have, have a lot of covenant breaking that we do. There's a lot of covenants with God that we have broken. Because we don't understand the power of covenant. We don't understand many times how important it is. And generationally, when people break covenant with God through disobedience or rebellion, there's a breach, which means there's a break in the flow of the blessings. Because God's heart is to release blessings to us. It's like a river. And as soon as there's disobedience of covenant breaking or rebellion in any way, sin, there's a breach. It's almost like a disconnection in the flow of the blessings. And God wants us to come and also restore these breaches that happen spiritually and generationally. That's the other side of the coin. Because if you can restore it, and the season is a season of restoration, you know. So we prophesy in the Spirit, Lord, an anointing for restoration upon your people. Lord, that you release angels that will come and administer restoration in every area of our life. I release a settling anointing upon you. And Lord, we ask for angels, Lord, that will be released from this place tonight to release restoration um, in, in people's lives in the name of Jesus. And I feel part of, the, part of the restoration process is to repair broken covenants. Either that you had with other people or with God. It's so important. Because God, everything God does is based on covenants. God is a covenant keeping God. He is a God. You can't disconnect His name from covenant. Everything He does is from a basis of covenant. All the blessings that He has for you is connected on the basis of covenant. It is blessings connected to the covenant. So covenant is a word I think nowadays that is very cheap. People don't understand it. And covenant is really a pledge of total loyalty, total commitment between two or more people. A binding agreement, almost like an endless partnership. And if we understand how powerful our covenant is, and you have a covenant with God, you have a new covenant with God, the Bible says, through Jesus Christ. If you've accepted Jesus on the cross, you've entered into a new covenant with God. So your whole basis and foundation with God and your whole relationships is based on a covenant relationship, which is a binding, endless partnership agreement. And uh, I was, when I was preparing, I, I thought about, uh, you know, the, the number eight. The number eight is, is, is signifies not only new beginning, but covenant. And, and the covenant relations, uh, relationship is many times signified by that infinity sign, you know, which is almost like an eight. But it just goes like around the right. It's just this flowing relationships. 
And it's pretty much such a powerful um, relationship where it says that if the one is in trouble, the other one comes through for you. And it's not even a question about it. And we, um, we, you know, we are not used to covenant because it's something in our culture that's really been watered down. And it's really something that in the biblical time was, was such an important thing. And uh, God wants us to walk out um, the covenant with Him. We have to walk in that covenant with Him. But He also wants us to be faithful in walking out our covenants with each other. So there's a two side of it. God says, I want you to walk out this covenant with me, but also the covenants with other people, that faithfulness. And, um, but many, you know, many people are, 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 you know, covenant breaking is a huge thing in our society today. People are covenant breakers, thieves and, and liars. You know, it's so easy nowadays, you know, and, and we, are so, we are so easy um, making covenants. And we're all guilty of that, you know, and it's something that we need to focus on. You know, even, even if you just... You know, you make a promise to do something and you don't do it or, you know, I'm, I must go and bry with you on it, you know, at Bobley uh, Easterfontein. So I must remember the covenants and the promises. Sometimes we just say, I'm going to phone you next week, we're going to have tea and then you never call. I'm just saying, it's just small little things. We must go back to the, to, the, to the place of covenant where your yes is your yes and your no is your no and rather not say anything. But I just think it's that cult. It may, may sound petty, but... It's literally where God says, I want you to honor your, 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 your covenants with each other and your covenants with me. And not even talk about vows. You know, we were once, uh, I think in Johannesburg at a, at a conference there, and the Holy Spirit was just saying, the Lord was just saying, pay your vows to me, honor your vows to me. Many times we make promises to God where we're in the difficult times, and when you get breakthrough, we forget about the covenants that we have made with God. We forget, Lord, I'm going to give that person that money. I'm going to do this for you if I get breakthrough. And you forget that covenant. And the fact that you don't honor your vows with God sometimes brings a judgment upon you. Because you just forget uh, that. So this is, this is powerful. And covenants are very common in biblical times. But most, Christ, most Christians don't understand covenants. And also we are in a society where, uh, where they don't live in covenant. I think the most basic covenant that you get is the marriage covenant that people um, have or think is a covenant, I mean, and that is also messed up. I just think a lot of people don't even know, uh, you know, this, 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 the seriousness of this. And people can just, you know, we're in a culture where people just think, you know, it's too hard and too tough for me, I'm just bail out. If it's too hard for me, you know, I just break the covenant and move on. There's not that seriousness of, of commitment, even in ministry relationships, not even in a in, in business relationship. I think any relationship, I think we are in a season where people just walk in and out of covenants and they totally disregard the, the seriousness of that. And it becomes cheap, you know, when, uh, you know, when things are too hard and I don't want to push through, it's too difficult to push through, I don't want to make the effort, let me break the covenant, let me just move on. And when there's issues, we need to understand that we are in covenant relationships with people, especially friends in ministry, wherever you are, and that those relationships need to be treasured. And we shouldn't break covenant just because we feel like it or it's the easy way to do. We should really need to go and, and, um, and do what we can to be able to maintain that. And a lot of people are currently in a mess because of breaking of covenants. And they don't know, they know, they don't know it's because of that. And they don't know how to get out of it. So it's important, I feel, that not only to pursue God as a covenant God, but also to repair the breaches of covenant, which is two, side of, two sides of a coin that will take you to restoration and the fullness of restoration. So breaking covenant is really a very serious matter. And the question is, if you've broken covenant with God, but through disobedience with people, you know, is there, is, there power, is there power to redeem yourself? Yes, there is. The Bible says that God... God is a God that, that gives a way out to restore and repair broken covenants. There's always a path of restoration that God has um, for His people. So it doesn't matter what you have done or how you messed up, there's always a path of restoration that God offers for you um, that is obviously conditional. Okay, so this is important. So I want to look at a few examples of covenant breakers in the Bible that were completely restored. It's always great if you look at other people and you thought, wow, I'm not that bad. If the, oh, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm not that bad. If God can touch that person, forgive that person, then surely I have a chance as well. Because the enemy comes in and lie to us, you know, and tell us that what we have done, what we have been through, you know, cannot be forgiven. We have gone too far back. We have broken too much covenant with God. And, you know, many times when we reflect it to the word and to the message of grace and God's love for us, we see it's a total lie. And that's an invitation for us to say, Lord, I'm, I'm grabbing onto your path of restoration that you always have for me. 
I'm grabbing onto that rope of hope that you always have for me. And God is always inviting us to come back. doesn't matter how far you've gone back or what has happened. So we see there was a few heavy covenant breakers in the Bible. And we see how God completely restored them. God already had the way out for him. So let's talk about this. The first one was that woman caught in adultery in John 8. Do you remember this woman? The Pharisees brought this woman. They dragged her to Jesus, probably with motives. And they says, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Who knows that you are super guilty then? Wasn't what taken with pictures with the long lens. She was really, she was really, it was not even suspicion. She was really caught in the act of adultery. I mean, they had to probably brag, grab, her, grab her out of the bedroom. And they dragged her to Jesus, the Pharisees. And they said, this, is, this woman is guilty. And um, they actually brought her so to test Jesus to see what would Jesus say about this lady. Because remember, the Pharisees were experts in the law. And according to the law, the penalty required for adultery was? Stoning. 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 They were, they were specialists in the law. And the law said if you are commit adultery, that it's, it's, it's stoning. So they want to test Jesus to say, Jesus, are you not going to move with the law? Or are you going to do something funny again like we used to there? And you know, in the Bible, why they said people should have been stoned was for two, well, was, was, well, well, there was two types of sin that they felt in the Old Testament you need to be stoned for. The first one was sexual sin and the other one was witchcraft. Because those are the only two sins that affects your body, your soul, and your spirit. Those th sin, sexual sin has the ability to defile you right into your spirit. Okay, and that is that your spirit area is where you, where you communicate with God. Your spirit man is, is the area you communicate with, through the Holy Spirit with, with, with God. And that's why when you go into witchcraft and those things, it really defiles you, not only on a physical level, but um, also body, soul, and spirit. Okay, other sins only defiles your body and your soul area, doesn't touch your spirit, man. But these two were di very dangerous, and they knew if you've done that, you were spoiled forever. Get the stones, and bye, Felicia, there you go. And it's, it's finished, and it, it sounds harsh that they had to stone people, but that was the requirement of the law because of the, the three-dimensional defilement. They just thought, oh, goodness, you are totally defiled now. So this is, what they, this is what they have done. And then, do you remember, then they brought her here. She was like shivering, and Jesus then answered and says to them, Yes, I know the law says that, but let him who is without sin cast the first stone. So we can see that Jesus never condoned or approved of sin and said, oh, well done, lady, amazing, you know. No, Jesus never condoned it. He never approved it, but what he saw was a more serious sin. And that was the sin of self-righteous pride that these religious leaders had. And then the Bible says Jesus came down and he sat on the ground he went down on his knees and he wrote something on the ground and according to hebrew writings he was writing down the private sins of the pharisees that were standing there okay yeah um you are cheating on your wife you are embezzling money you are doing this so he's writing all the private sins of the guys that was the pharisees that were standing there and as they read it they got such a big shock and they were convicted of their sins and they left that's according to the, to, the, to the Hebrew writings. That is actually what he written. So it was, a, it was a thing to expose and say, okay, sh she's wrong, but, but there's, a, there's firstly an, a, a, a greater sin, and that's self-righteous pride. That you, you are just as bad as this woman, even worse. Ma, but, but, but you want to judge this person. You want to, oh, no, she must be killed. And, and this, is, this is a very terrible um, attitude and a sin is that of self-righteous pride. And he told her, Listen, I'm not going to condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. So when, you, when Jesus comes on the scene, everything changes. When you have an encounter with Jesus, one encounter changes you completely. There's immediate deliverance. I knew a girl that was, that was lesbian, and she actually gives her testimony all over the place. And she had an encounter. People prayed for her, and she had an encounter. She was in a relationship with a lady. They owned a house together and everything. And she said while, she, while they all, you know, having socials and brides and all the, the ladies together, they were always talking that, you know, their lifestyle is fine because Jesus loves people. And Jesus, um, you know, how can something that feels so amazing, can be, how can it be so wrong? And, you know, the love of God will, will, will supersede that and it's actually fine. Until one night she, was, she, was, she had an encounter with Jesus in her kitchen. She was bending down to the dishwasher, I think, when she came up, he stood right in front of her. And um, he didn't talk to her. I think she, 
she told me she put put her hands out and touched. She, f she thought it was. It looks like a ghost, but it was solid. And she says the eyes. One look in the eyes. Total shift. One look in the eyes of Jesus. Immediate deliverance. Thank you, Lord. So, thank you, Jesus. So, can you imagine if just one look from Jesus' eyes can deliver you? So, this it's easy for Jesus to say, go out and sin no more because she had an encounter with Jesus. She was probably immediately delivered and Jesus gave her a fresh start. Who wants a fresh start? Jesus can give you a fresh start as you hold on to Him. And, as a legalistic spirit or religious spirit will say, no, Jesus, it's not fair. She must pay for what she has done. She's bad, bad, bad. And she must, do, she must, she must, she must pay. She must pay. And, you know, many times we have that attitude where we condemn others because of our self, own self-righteousness and we condemn ourselves. It's a legalistic spirit. Yeah, but they must pay. Yeah, they must pay, you pay for what they've done. And, you know, God mustn't over, overlook that, you know. And it's difficult when people do things against you and you feel hurt and broken. It's difficult to, 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 to pray and bless them and release them. And not saying, Lord, they must pay. What happens if it happens to you and, and somebody else says you have to pay? Then you say, Jesus, please, I don't want to pay. So John 3.17 says, Jesus' goal was to save sinners and set them free from condemnation. Okay, so we see by the law this woman deserved to die, but Jesus didn't operate by the law. Jesus operated by grace. According to the law, she had to be killed. Jesus didn't operate by the law. He operated by grace. But grace, which is empowerment, which is that... Which, which, is, which is the empowerment that the, the, the Lord released and His mercy and goodness is not, an, it's not a, a, a free door or a free thing to, to be able to say, well, now I can sin and enjoy every moment of it because grace. Because some ministries do teach that. You know, sin as much as you like, enjoy every moment of it. But because grace, God's grace will cover it. We're not there to abuse the grace that God's given us. It's not there to abuse. It's your whole heart of, of obedience to the Lord and and so, so we see that Jesus operated in grace and not by the law. And grace supersedes religion. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You see, it's, it's a mercy and grace are currencies of heaven. And God said in His word, this one is higher than that thing. So when it is so, and God says it, it settles it. So that's why you can say, and you can stand on grace and say, Lord, because people with the religious spirit, with the legalistic spirit, will always hold you accountable. And, you know, they will, the finger pointing, and they will check how you go out of line. And it doesn't mean that you are right, but it's about grace. It's about grace, 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 grace that supersedes religion, the legalistic spirit that says you have to pay for what you've done and pay again and pay again. And you can't forgive yourself. Some people can't forgive themselves. They should have been Roman Catholics. Whip themselves. Oh, I'm so bad. Whip themselves constantly with the whips. Okay, because if Jesus forgiven you, it's gone. It's wiped out. And the enemy loves to come back to us and remind us of our past. And you're so bad, bad, bad. Remember what you've done that time. If you hear that voice, you know it's the voice of condemnation, which is not the voice of God. It's not the voice of God. The Holy Spirit convicts which is a gentle voice that makes you feel so bad you can't wait to run to God to make right. Okay? That's conviction. Condemnation is this condemning voice that says you're so bad, you ever think you're going to make it, oh, I don't think God's going to like you, and I don't think you're going to, you know, that, you know what the voice of condemnation is. That is not of God. So we see this is powerful. So this lady, God gave her a new beginning. Isn't that amazing? Fantastic. But the legalistic spirit, the religious spirit would have destroyed her. Okay, so but we see then in the second story was about John 4, the Samaritan woman at the well. Do you remember this story? Now this lady, Jesus rocked up at the well, asked her for a drink. She was totally shocked because the Jews didn't speak to the Samaritans at all. It was a cultural no-no. And above that, it was also a super no-no that a man should, should talk to a woman. So Jesus broke all the protocol of that day. Many times, some of you will break the protocol of the day, and you'll, I mean, I think the people in this ministry break, people think you break the protocol, and you think you're weird, and whatever, that's why we hide in the bushes, no, not sure. Um, but if you are radical, you're going to be protocol breakers in terms of, of, of old systems and old structures of religion, old wine structures, people will think, what's wrong with these people, they're too wild for me. 
So they, he broke the protocol, but it was for a reason. And he went to this woman and he knew what was going on. She had a bad reputation, five divorces, and she was living with the new boyfriend. I mean, who wants, uh, who wants to talk to somebody like that? Five divorces and said, oh, well, let's keep this one, you know. Let's keep the middleman and just go and, and live with my boyfriend now. This marriage thing is not working. And she was also an outcast in her society. So Jesus knew of her past, but he was more concerned about her spiritual state. And he said to her, listen here, girlfriend, I can give you living water. When I, what I have to offer can satisfy you. I will give you living water and you will never thirst again. Because there was a vacuum inside of her. She was looking for love. In the wrong places. She was looking for attention. She was looking for capability coming from a dysfunctional past. And she was trying to fill that vacuum with love. And your body can never be used as an instrument to deal with the spiritual matter. People use their body as an instrument to deal with a spiritual issue. And you can never do that. And that's why you end up on the one person to the next person. You, you end up empty because of that dynamic. And she then realized when Jesus touched her, when Jesus looked at her, Jesus, you know, awakened the faith in her and she realized he was the Messiah. It was probably by divine revelation, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, if Jesus touched you and, and you just look in his eyes and you are totally delivered. What, I mean, not even to talk about when he speaks to you or when he touches you. Can you imagine? It's a whole power encounter. And she, was, she had one encounter with Jesus and she was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. She became one of the greatest evangelists and a woman apostles that that region have seen. I mean, I've read a little bit more about the, the Hebrew writings, uh, what she did. And, and she went to do evangelism later in Africa. She was powerful. She was actually the first convert that was an evangelist for the kingdom. One woman, can, in a moment, turn around. When Jesus touched you, there's transformation. One encounter. And there's many places, even churches, that says when you, if you're divorced, you're disqualified. You can't be in ministry. You can't do something from God, which is a lie. We can see this, how Jesus comes and, 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 and makes a way for redemption, restores the broken covenant, repositions you, and puts you on a new track. This is the second story. Do you want to hear another story? Huge covenant breakers in the Bible, huge. I mean, like, you know, you don't even want to read it in the tabloids nowadays. Okay, and we see, let's go to some men. Apostle Peter, another covenant breaker. Peter, Peter, Peter. The night before the crucifixion, Peter told Jesus, listen, Jesus, I will lay my life down for you. Woo, and I'll just be with you. And somebody, you know, you know, I will never leave you. I'll always be with you, and I am with you, and you will never have to be worried because I'm laying my life down for you. And Jesus said to him, listen, tomorrow before the cock crows three times, you're going to disown me and deny me. And Peter nearly got a angina. And he said, oh, Jesus, how can you ever say that? Never, 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 never. And you know what happens with the never, never? And I always tell Kari, never, ever say this is not going to happen to you or this is not your weak area. Wait until you come to the right circumstances where you've never been exposed to and then we see how you operate. Because you are not, if, you, if you've been, if, you, if God exposes you to certain circumstances, you never know how you're going to react or if that happens. And what happened is he was exposed to unusual circumstances that he was not um, mature enough for. And as we know, the next day, they said to him, Oh, aren't you the guy that's with Jesus? Aren't you the guy that's this and that? Didn't we see him with you? And the fear of death and the fear um, of being killed caused him to deny Jesus. So in his, in his, in his, and he broke covenant. So in his emotional area, he wasn't mature enough to stand against the resistance and the persecution. What happened if we're going to be persecuted in the places that we are? You know, are we also going to deny Jesus? Are we denying our, our values? You know what I mean. So sometimes those things challenge you. think you'll never do it. And then, oh my goodness, um, the devil made me do it or whatever the people say. All right. So I'm coming to a close. And when it happened, he heard the words of Jesus in his ears. And he, when the cock crowed, he wept bitterly. And he had great, great remorse. Is there redemption for a person like that? He denied Jesus. He was a disciple. Some people would say, but I don't think there's ever redemption is going to hell. He denied Jesus. What worse can, sin can you do than to deny Jesus? You know, it's one of, it, it's, it's terrible. But we see that, that Jesus always, it's part of his covenant nature to create a pathway back for us to him. Although you have broken covenant and messed up and you have been disobedient. And we see that after Jesus' resurrection, 
Jesus created the pathway for him. And at some stage, they were sitting next to the Sea of Galilee. And I think they were eating fish in the morning. I mean, they don't have porridge in those days. And um, Jesus then spoke to him and he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Again, he said, Peter, do you love me? Go and feed my sheep. And the third time he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Go and feed my sheep. What do you think was Jesus doing? He was reversing and uh, revoking all the denials by replacing it with the statements of love. That's why I asked him three times. When, when he said, I love you three times, there was a divine reversal of that, that covenant breaking that happened when he denied him. And then he, commis he, he, he commissioned and he recommissioned Jesus to say, go and feed my sheep. And he commissioned Dominic saying, go out and make fishes of men. So we see that Jesus came and he removed the spiritual reproach from Peter through that transaction. Judas and Peter both were disciples. They both committed covenant breaking. Who knows that Judas also committed covenant breaking? But what was the difference? The one had a repentant heart and says, I'm sorry. The other one said, well, stuff that, you know, I'm, I'm over, you know, I'm over the boundaries anyway. You know, there's no returning back you know, to Jesus, which was a lie. And we see he committed suicide. And many people think what they have done is too hard and it's too, it's too bad and it's too big of a covenant breaking with God that they never can go back. And the enemy lies to them and beguiles them and sends a spirit of death around them that will totally tell them and surround them and tell them that you, that you can might as well kill yourself. There's no redemption for you. And that's where people have no hope, and then they committed suicide. That's what happened to Judas. He, he didn't know that he could go back to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. Well, Peter did. So this is exciting. Let's look at the last, the last person. So Peter was restored fully, and he was recommissioned, because you're only going to recommission somebody that is fully restored. Jesus recommissioned him. He said, this is your assignment. There you go. He was restored. King David. King David, number four. King David ended his life with, with the identity of where God is saying he's a man after my own heart. He ended. He was remembered of something. You're a man after my own heart. Imagine God tells you, you are a man or woman after his own heart. Isn't that amazing to hear? But you know that he had a great failures in his life. He had terrible, he committed terrible sins. You know what David did. It was covenant breaking. He, he raped Bathsheba because I don't think she had a choice to do what he wanted to do or not because he was the king. There was lust, adultery, all that's terrible sins. And then when you do one sin and you don't know how to deal with the sin, and, you don't, and you're too deep in, it leads to more sin. But you want to use the next sin to cover up the old sin, the previous sin, and to hide what happened to Bathsheba because she was pregnant, he killed the husband. So it was now rape, murder, covenant breaking, the whole package. But God had a plan of restoration for David as well, already had the plan. And he sent the prophet Nathan to David. And Nathan then confronted David about his sin. Who knows that Nathan should have had a life policy? <laughs> because even those days, if you're going to, this, to, the, to the king and say, Hello, I just want to, you know, coming from God and I want to expose your sin. And God wants to say this is totally unacceptable. Then David had the power to kill Nathan and say, mm, Okay, let's deal with that. But David had a humbled response. You see, David's heart was soft and gentle and contrite and pliable. And he had a humbled response. When the prophet came, he said, oh, my goodness, I need to repent. You know, so next time when the prophet comes to you and tells you, you need to stop the sin. Don't say, who are you here to tell me, you know. Uh, just, yeah, be humble. Be humble. He had a humbled response and humbled repentance immediately. Psalm 51 says, David, that was the whole prayer of David. I'm almost done. David begins then confessing his sin. He says, then, Lord, I start off with confessing my sin with humble repentance. He said, cleanse me, Lord. He said, blot out my iniquities. Give me grace um, to change, Lord. Create in me a pure heart. Renite, re, um, renew a right spirit within me. This, is, this, is, this was his prayer. Give me a willing spirit, Lord, to sustain me. I'm bad, 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 but I'm totally humbling myself before you in humble repentance. Yet true and real repentance. There's a difference between that and repentance as you get free of judgment. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. No. You must have true repentance. True, 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 true. And he said to the Lord, Lord, don't despise my broken and my contrite heart. 
that I give to you as a sacrifice. And then after he has done this whole thing and he repented humbly and went through all these prayers according to Psalm 51, Nathan then gave him another prophetic word after the repentance to say, David, the Lord has taken away your sin and you are restored. And we know how you ended up as a man of the, God's own heart. So I want to say to you, because before we pray, um, if the key is to humble yourself before God, when there's something wrong, when there's an area, don't be like the Pharisees to say, well, you know, um, seeing the sin and all the other people are not in your own life. And we need to humble ourselves. When somebody points out something in our life, be humble enough to say, um, Lord, I repent of this sin. Because sometimes we have spinach in our teeth. You know, somebody tells you something, um, your wife or your husband tells you something, you know, you're just like that and I didn't like it. When You, you know, do, do investigations of your own soul and of your own life and say, Lord, show me. Do I have those areas? And then we have to go for the Lord and repent and ask the Holy Spirit to put his finger on those areas. It's never too late to be restored. No sin is too big that it can't be forgiven. And God always wants to restore you. Say, God, say after me, God always wants to restore me. When you feel condemned, it's not of God. When you feel hopeless about your future, it's not of God. Hopelessness is... Not of God, because you always have a hope and always have a future. 1 John 1 9 says, and I'm going to end up with this. God says, If you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So repentance is the key. Firstly, when you've gone through a difficult thing or you've messed up, the first thing is to turn to God and not run away from God. Some people run. Okay, Judas ran. Turn to God, confess your, your sin, and trust the Lord for a fresh start. This is what the Bible says. This is how you clean your slate. This is how you clean your canvas. So we need to go back to God. And when God says, when you do that, never go back to that. Because God forgives you. And God cleanses you. And if, if you go back and you, and you remind yourself of those sins, you are self-righteous. Because God says, I've forgiven you, but you haven't forgiven yourself. So never go back to that um, and even respond to the enemy's lies. The enemy loves to go back in your past and accuse you of what you have done. The Bible says when Jesus washed you clean, it's done. God doesn't even remember it. So you dare don't go back in the name of Jesus. So I want you, we're going to pray now and um, let's take up the offering. Um, but as we pray, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to put his finger on those areas where there's breaches in terms of covenant. Ask the Lord to remind you of, of vows that you have made to God. And say, Lord, if you help me with this, I'm going to help that lady. If you're going to give me breakthrough, I'm going to do that. Remember if, there, if, you, if, you, if there's vows that you, that you have broken to the Lord. I remember when myself and Kari were still, I think we were not even married a year. And we married 25 years now. I remember we asked the Lord for breakthrough in a certain area. And we said we would, we would sow an amount of money to somebody. I can't remember even where. And because you're young and you, you know, there was a, there was a, you know, there was a, a, a time, a lot of time lapse, a big time lapse. When the miracle happened, we, we actually forgot about the vow. And one day as we were praying, suddenly it struck us. And, um, you know, that can actually bring a curse upon you if you've broken your vows to God or you're not, on, you're not honoring your vows to God. And we should be, that, that's why the Bible says, rather be slow to make promises and covenants with your mouth. If you do it with God, rather make sure that you can actually um, honor it and, and, and pay your vows. So that was, a, that was a big lesson because at the end of the day, when you make a promise and you don't uh, deliver on it, um, there's going to be a resistance in terms of your breakthroughs. Okay, so are, you, are we ready to pray? Let's stand. Okay, are we ready? Let's close our eyes. Father, Father I, thank you tonight I thank you tonight that you are a covenant-keeping God. God. Father, forgive me, Father, forgive me. For, not for not understanding the seriousness, the seriousness of, covenant. of covenant. I repent, I repent for being a covenant breaker, a, covenant breaker a, liar, a liar, and a thief, and a thief. Generationally, generationally and personally. And personally. I ask, tonight, I ask tonight, as I humble myself, I humble myself that you'll forgive me you for every sin, for every, every transgression, every, transgression, every iniquity. iniquity. Forgive, me forgive me for breaking covenant, for breaking covenant 
with you, Lord, through my words and through my actions. I humble myself tonight. I turn to you, Lord, and I confess these sins of lying, covenant breaking, and robbing you. Lord, forgive me. I ask tonight, Holy Spirit, that you shine your light, that you put your finger on every area of self-righteousness, of pride. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you release a conviction upon me in the area where I need to be convicted. And Lord, give us the grace that when you give us dreams, when you speak to us, that we will go in humble repentance, running to you, asking you to forgive us. And Lord, I thank you that you will make a way for us, that you release in this time your pathway of escape, that you release an anointing to redeem us. And I ask you, Father, that you show us how to navigate ourselves to be restored, to be redeemed, and to come to a place of full restoration. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Let's be seated. Is there any words, personal words? Come, please. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus. And, and if, if it's for you, if you feel the word is for you, also say receive. Okay. I receive. Amen. That's a good word, John. of that and I can encourage you to continue in other areas that you are still contending for to continue calling those things which be not as though mm -hmm. they were because that is acting in this nature and in the way that God has called you to I just want to add on to that I just also feel it might be areas from the outside that looks a certain way but the, the Lord wants to release life into it like real life and that and that smell and that fragrance and breathing new life into every area of your life. Um, so, Lord, we just thank you. We ask, Holy Spirit, you breathe life into every area, into her giftings, her callings, her identity, Lord. She's a mighty woman of God. She carries an amazing generational mantle, Lord. You need her in this season as a warrior, as a Deborah, as a one, Lord, who's going to come break the power of the enemy, Lord, and I've rooted in the name of Jesus, Lord. I thank you, Father, where the enemy has tried to take her out in this season, that you have sustained her through your grace. I thank you, Father, right now I speak life. I speak resurrection power and life into every area of your life, into your heart, into your mind, into your womanhood. I bless your calling. I bless your womanhood. I bless your identity. And I say, arise, woman of God, arise. I activate the anointings. I activate the mantles in the name of Jesus. And I speak life into every dead place. I speak resurrection power into every place in your soul, every place in your heart, every place in your life that looks dead. I prophesy life life and resurrection power to hit that part of your life in the name of Jesus Christ and it will be a full blooming and a blossoming in Jesus name. Amen. You see I'm prophesying when. <laughs> um, anybody else that wants to release a word? Diana, you got something? Nobody else got a word? 
I want the roll. Oh. <laughs> I want the roll. Let me just, let, let's just close off and let me pray for you. Father, I thank you right now in this atmosphere that there has been shifts and changes, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you are releasing your revelation to your people tonight. And Lord, and, and, and calling them not only closer in terms of covenant, but also calling them to restore covenant breaking and breaches. Father, give them the revelation that they need. I burn, I burn with fire demonic seals that's on information in the spiritual realm. And I thank you, Lord, right now that you remind people of places where they need to honor their vows to you. And Lord, the places where they've broken covenant with other people and with you, Lord. And as they come in humility before you, humility and humble submission before you, in repentance, running to you, Lord, that there shall be a rope of hope extended. There shall be a divine restoration, a path of restoration um, that will form for them, Lord. I thank you, Father, that we see from your word that even the most vilest sin, even the most terrible covenant breakers, Lord, were, were called back, Father, and how you redeemed them because they ran to you because of their hearts. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. I coming against a spirit of pride. I coming against a spirit, Lord, of religion and legalism and i bind and i fire you and i break your grip over god's people i break the locks on people's hearts and minds not to understand the things of god i bind every legalistic spirit that was to walk around like a wolf coming to to look at people and trying to blame shift and finger point at people in the name of jesus father i bind that spirit i ask that you make it powerless over people's lives and lord let there be a touch of your holy spirit upon their hearts father let them see how you see Touch their lives with your grace. Give them a glimpse of your heart, Lord Jesus, as you look at people. Lord, let them look at the word and let there be uh, mercy and forgiveness and grace for other people's mistakes. And um, Lord, we just thank you for that. I ask for an impartation in the room in the name of Jesus. Lord, and that there will be such a beautiful restoration of our covenant relationship with you. And also new experiences as we, as we deliberately and purposefully call out to you. In that place of covenant where we need you. I thank you, Father, for the great and mighty move of the Holy Ghost in our life by Pentecost. Father, we are hungry for an outpouring of a fresh dunamis power of the Holy Spirit into our life in those dry places. I thank you, Lord, that resurrection power is going to touch every area of our life. Father, we prepare ourselves. I thank you for it, Lord. And Lord, we honor you for what you're going to do in our life. Help us to move forward. Help us to have a violent spirit. And help us to be sober and vigilant, Lord, so we can see the traps of the enemy. We expose it and we can move forward in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you very much. We'll see you on Sunday. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Okay.